Let's give God a great clap this morning. Such a privilege to be back here in one of my favorite churches. I was talking to Pastor Brett. I think I've been coming up here, what, 26, 27 years, Pastor Brett? I can't even remember how long I've been coming. But it's just such a blessing to be here. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we're just so thankful for the privilege of being called your sons and daughters. Help us, Lord. Help me to articulate what's on your heart this morning. Amen. What an interesting time we find ourselves in. Uh, nothing catches God by surprise. Nothing, and I'm going to speak to you very directly and very specifically as a church this morning. Um, what is God saying to Grace Covenant Church and to the body of Christ? I was, we had a leaders meeting yesterday, and I'm going to be pretty prophetic this morning. I talked to Pastor Brett about it. And as I was getting ready to speak, sitting out there in worship, the Lord began to speak to me, and he showed me a vision, which is really a pretty powerful impression from the Holy Spirit on your mind. And I, and I saw our, our country just so broken at every level, economically, spiritually, morally, polarized, ethnic pain, political pain. And I saw as I looked at it, beloved, just these, I don't know the right word, seemed like massive fissures, just gashes and, and just it, tip top. And then I got homed in on DC in the greater DC. And I, I just saw this massive pain and just like the very earth broken and torn apart. And I was reminded in 2018, end of the year, when the Lord first began to show me about this crisis and I saw New York shaken and things shattered and broken. And I was standing in front of one of your sister churches, tremendous church in Nashville, multi-site church, Bethelwood Outreach Center, and I was standing there on New Year's Eve service talking about what was going to happen and the economy was going to crash and people were going to be afraid. And 17 months from that very, that very day, there would come a time of division, polarization, ethnic pain would rise to the top. And of course, 17 months later, Mr. Floyd was killed. Where, where's God in all that? Like in the middle of all this pain, where might God be? I was reminded in that service, and I'll speak to you more directly, of Psalm 62 and 3. He said, you made the land to quake. It was just torn open. Repair its breaches. It just totters. The world seems to be tottering right now. I was on the phone with the vice president of another country last week. She wept and said, we have no resources. It might be the end of like 2023 before they're vaccinated. Where's God in all this? David says, you've made your people see hard things. You've given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. Like, where is it in this tearing, these, these breaches? Here's what I hear the Lord saying. Say this to Grace Company. What you see is breaches. What you see is fissures. What you see is unhealable in your own nation, seemingly no answer. Polarization will not go away. Pain and injustice that once again comes to the surface. What you see is unhealable fissures. I see as furrows. For I've allowed this country to be plowed deep. I have revealed some of the very nerves of pain for this country will never be healed from the outside in it'll only be healed from the inside out and I have allowed deep furrows to be ripped across the world and ripped across the nation and you would say then Lord when will you flow from heaven when will it flow I will flow when you sow and as you sow your lives and the seeds of the gospel in this city. And as you lay 
your life down in to these very furrows. As you rise up and identify with me, I will water the greater DC area with the rains of revival by my spirit. And I will give you every corner, says the Lord, of this metropolitan area as your inheritance. And I will multiply sites and churches. And you are not to say there is no answer, but it's right to say there is only one answer. Can I find a reconciled people who will lay their lives down? Can I find a people who will identify with me in this hour? Can I find a people who will rise beyond political polarization? Can I find a people who will do business with me? For I have allowed furrows to be created, tearings, gashes. Say not they're just unhealable fissures, divisions that will never go away. For I have allowed things to be gashed deeply that I might pour my spirit out. And if you will sow, I will flow. For you are one of the churches that I have given this city to as a great inheritance. And I will multiply you many times over. And sites will break out throughout this greater metropolitan area. And I will sweep over campuses and young people will flock to you. And I will do this, says the Lord. What does it take to touch an area? Hopefully I'll get to my notes in a minute. Like, what does it take? I, I'm reminded of John chapter 12 when Jesus came into Jerusalem. Now, if you imagine that moment, everyone thought Jesus had won. We just celebrated Passion Week. He came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. You would have thought he was the Roman Empire, emperor. People throwing off their cloaks, palm brands, screaming, yelling, the king has come. What a moment. Even Rome was absent from the scene. They did not have the political power to stop it. The whole city, by the scores of thousands, even the Pharisees said, the whole world has gone out to him. Even the Greeks said, show us Jesus. His disciples thought, man, we've won. The church attendance has never been so large. We've never had so many thousands. We've never had so much political power. And Jesus cried. How could he cry at his moment of triumph? How could he cry when it would seem he'd come to the acme of his power and presence? How could that be? Because he realized popularity did not win a city. He realized that a big parade wasn't going to win a city. He realized it would take more than burgeoning crowds of happy people who would later yell for his death. And his disciples said, you know, like, think, why are you crying? The nation was broken under Roman oppression. The people themselves had been destroyed years before, ethnically cleansed, enslaved, deported. Just great pain. And Jesus said this, unless God finds the seed, unless somewhere there is a seed that's willing to be sown into this pain, if there's not some man, some woman, some young person, some way who will be sown by God into these furrows of pain, nothing will ever change. And I am that seed. Because until someone goes down into that furrow and seemingly dies, there is no change. And then the Lord spoke out. And everyone said, man, it's thundered. They heard thunder. Why? Because it was getting ready to rain. Because God had a seed. Grace covenant. You'll be jumping down into these great furrows of pain. 
because it is going to rain. It's going to rain on this city. It's going to rain on this country. It's going to rain on this world. I cried out to God in intercession last night out of Isaiah 29, where after he talks about these great judgments, the Bible says the farmer doesn't keep plowing when it's time to sow. I said, how much longer will you plow? How much longer will you break us? He said, okay, it's time to sow. And when you sow, my spirit will flow. I'm going to just entitle this vignette. Meet me in Galilee, Grace Covenant Church, 2020-2030. Your decade of doom or your decade of destiny. What's like the next 10 years look like for the church? Like what could it be? Naysayers everywhere say the divisions are permanent. Naysayers everywhere say that the cauldron that's become America, it'll just steam over the top. They write books now making money on the next civil war. But what would God say about that? What would God say to his church? He tried to tell him it was coming, Jesus did. He told him in John 16, 32, he said, an hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you're each going to be scattered to his own home. We won't see each other for a while. You're going to leave me all alone, it's going to get so bad you're going to run and you're going to be stuck at home. The disciples could not comprehend what they were going to face. Could not comprehend. But in this warning, which he only articulated more in Matthew 26, 30 through 35, he says, you're going to be tested. A dark time's coming, speaking of his betrayal, his death. But he kept, there was this promise that he kept giving them. He said, when you come out of this hard time, when you come out of this scattering, when you come out of this painful time, meet me in Galilee. I mean, what's that all about? In Matthew 26, 32, he told him, after I'm raised up, I'll be waiting for you in a certain location called Galilee. When he'd been raised from the dead and Mary was waiting around, the angel said, do this really quick. It's so important that they get this. It's important because if they don't get this, their current reality will become a mentality even after the reality changes. You go quickly as you can and tell them, I'm in Galilee, I'm waiting for you. Then she meets Jesus, he says, man, go tell my brothers I'm in Galilee. What was in Galilee? It's where they were commissioned. It's where they were called. It's where they saw the first great catch. They fought, saw the first great miracle. We've been scattered, masked, distanced, polarized. More conspiracy theories. Watched our capital attack by a crazy mob. Look, where's the answer? Where is the answer for the mire you feel in your soul? Where is the answer? Is a whole generation of Christians have stayed away for health. We pray it's not habit. Where is the answer? Jesus says, meet me in Galilee. What's that mean? I'm calling my church back into mission. The moment's now. I thank God that we live in a country that's being vaccinated. That's not the norm. Meet me in mission. There's three stages. I see the spirit of God bringing us through right now. There are three stages. And quite honestly, we are in stage one. On the evening of the first day, it says in John 20, 26 to 28, how many of you know when Jesus 
was raised from the dead, all of history changed. Raise your hand. It was the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. What's happened? They on lockdown. They locked up in their home, even though history has been changed for 12 hours. They locked up. You realize even when everyone's vaccinated and everything's better, there'll be certain people stay locked up. It's just so easy for your reality to become your mentality. That even when you stop being besieged, you still keep besieged mentality. They're locked up. We live in a locked up world. We have every nation churches in 81 nations. All over Europe, they have not been in a building for 13 months. In Asia, bound up. You may say, I'm locked up, pastor. I'm just not locked up in my home. I'm locked down in my mind and I'm afraid and I don't know what to do. I'm locked down in my marriage, locked up in my finances. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be unto you. There you cannot quarantine my Jesus. You can't lock him out. You can't lock him up. You can't distance him. You can't mask him. No matter where you are today, he's breaking through. No matter where you are online and what you're facing, no matter where you are in this city, the same Jesus that walked through the walls is walking into your home today. There's a breakthrough and a breakout coming. He's breaking through our mentalities, breaking into our homes, breaking into our marriages. Does the world think they can lock him down? The world think they can shut him out? Does the world think just because we could not come to a church building, there was no church? I see my Jesus walking into homes, walking into lockdowns, walking into a people in pain over being distanced, a people in pain over relatives dying without them there, funerals where no one could go, weddings that seem dangerous. This is what my Jesus would say to you today. Peace. Be still. I've got this. I'm walking through your walls. I'm walking through your halls. I'm walking to your pains. See my hands and feet. You know what's astonishing? And really sorrowful. Eight days later, they were still locked up. He said, man, hurry into mission. Why do you hurry? Because if you don't embrace mission, siege becomes siege mentality. You're mired in it, molded in it. Eight days later, they still locked up. Jesus has walked through the wall. It's Thomas. He goes, I don't believe it. No, 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 no. I don't care about the old vaccine. I don't care what they say. I'm just locked up, locked down. I'm still staying. Unless I see Jesus myself, I will not go to church. Unless he appears in my house with a big invitation card. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus walks through the wall. Says, I'm just here for you, Thomas. My Lord, my God. He's so patient when we're afraid. He's so patient when we're hurting. He's so patient. We're in phase one. It's breakthrough and breakout. He's breaking into our homes, into our lives. He's loving up on us. He's revealing who he is. He's building our faith. He's touching us. Grief has swept planet. But then there's a second stage that's coming, breathed on. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
How many of you know National Geographic has a collage of pictures at the end of the year? The end of the year 2020 was one of the most heartbreaking collages I've ever seen. Unemployment, pain, hurt, brutality, death. And National Geographic said 2020 was the year that took our breath away. Hundreds of thousands, millions fought for breath. Here in our own country, like many, there was not just a fight for physical breath, there was a fight for social breath, justice breath, ethnic breath. And do not think in your minds we are the only place where people fought for breath. I was called by a pastor in a country far away outside of Ian. He said, listen, the champion of civil rights in my country, an African woman, She'd broken every barrier, been filled with peace and reconciliation. A young white man targeted her two daughters and murdered them in the streets. And the police took selfies by their bodies. I got on the phone with that woman. She's bedridden in pain. Husband, she goes, Pastor, all my life I've given myself to this and they've killed my girls. Where's the answer to that kind of pain? As she cried and I cried and I prayed with her. Where is the answer? It's not just a year, but years which suck the breath of the people away. And here's what I hear Jesus saying. If 2020 took your breath away, in 2020, I'm going to breathe on you. And he walked into a broken people. He walked in to his shattered disciples. He walked through their walls, walked through their pain, walked, and he just said this. Hear me now by the Holy Spirit. He's coming to breathe on you. He's coming to touch you. He's stepping through Ethnic walls, polarization, political walls, mental walls, emotional walls. Let's give him a hand. He's here to breathe on us. He's here to breathe on us. I want you to raise your hands. Say, Jesus, breathe on me. Take a deep breath. Say, breathe on me. Say it again. Breathe on me. Let's take a deep breath. Let's exhale. Now say, Jesus, breathe on DC. Breathe on this area. Hear me now. This pain will not be wasted. Pain transforms or deforms. It never leaves us the way we were before it came. But this church, in an hour of national anguish, has been prepared for decades to live a different way. And as you jump down in to the seething furrows as living seeds of redemption, He'll water you. But the breakthrough came to the breathe on. And my last point, it came to the boatload. Finally, after 12 days, they made it down there. You help me understand, Pastor Britt. Jesus says, quick, they say 12 days. Now, I will say in their defense, it's about a three-day three walk, two and a half days. Unless you're like Pastor Brett, it's a lot faster. If you're like me, it might have been a seven-day walk. That's a whole other story anyway. Okay. There was a boatload coming. They finally got back down to Galilee. Didn't see Jesus. Where's Jesus? Well, he's been waiting down there for you a lot of days, brothers. They get on their boat. Only seven of the, two, of the 11 made it. Judas gone. He's killed. Dead. Killed himself. Peter says, I'm going fishing. The scholars debate, were they going to start a business because they're failures or they're going to test God and see what would happen? 
They get out in the Sea of Galilee where they had the catch and the storm. They fished all night, caught nothing. Now hear this prophetically. He said, Pastor Jim, we fished all night, caught nothing. Pastors all over America tell me, I don't know what we've caught. The Bible says, just as the day was breaking, it was dawn. I'm telling you by the Holy Spirit, we come to the dawn of a new age for the church. We're at dawn, it's just too dark to see the new day as yet. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Too dark to see him, too dark to figure it. May I tell you, no matter how dark it is where you find yourself today, Jesus is standing there. I can't see him, pastor. It doesn't mean he's not there. He's standing outside your home, outside your marriage, outside your business, outside your life, at the door of our capital, at the door of the hearts of our nation. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? Caught anything, church? They answered them, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and they could not haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And the disciple, John, whom Jesus loves, said, Peter, it's the Lord. You realize you can get so discouraged you don't recognize his voice? It could be so dark. May I tell you, there's coming a harvest of such great quantity. We'll barely be able to drag it in. Who'll be the John to the generation of Peters that can't see or hear him and say, it's the Lord? Peter was so touched, he thought it was all over because he'd failed and denied during this time. But when he saw there was still a purpose and a catch, he jumped into the water and swam to him. No matter how you failed, he's not giving up on you. No matter how you've walked through this, he's not giving up on you. Now, here's the stunning thing. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment. He was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about 100 yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it. And Brenda, catch this. They say, hey, we've caught nothing. Nothing's really happened. What's going to happen to the church? All the naysayers say, many will never come back to church. It'll never be the same. What do they know? I've never, ever based my life on human speculation. I won't start now. I don't care what Fox or CNN says. I don't care what the news says. No, I'm not ignorant, but I care what the word of God says. The word of God, not the word of man, sets my emotions. It just does. Now, when they got ashore, this is amazing, Jesus already cooked them fish. What's he saying? He said, you say you caught nothing? I never stop fishing. May I tell you, when we come ashore out of this crisis, we're going to discover Jesus never stopped fishing. Do we somehow think because we got quarantined, the Holy Ghost was quarantined? Do we somehow think you can distance the Holy Ghost? Do we somehow feel that Jesus has not been catching human souls by hundreds and thousands and they'll be coming back to be clean? Do you not think people we've not even seen in church have not been touched? What is Jesus saying? Just because you caught nothing, you don't think I caught anything? You don't think I caught anything? Now you bring me some fish because I've been catching for 13 months. I've been drawing, catching, bringing. And Peter, under a fresh anointing, hauled the net in. There were 153 fish, which some say is the number of how many species of fish there were in the Mediterranean. The Bible says they were great fish. Beloved Grace Covenant, online, in your sights and your church plans. Jesus has been fishing the whole time. Oh, we've lost ground. Who are you to say that? Oh, 
oh, what will become of the church? You think a little quarantine and a little plague that was no near as bad as many we've had in the past was going to destroy what whole empires could not destroy the church? Did you, do you think that? Oh, our nation's polarized. They're terrible fissures. Oh, they're furrows. It's time for you to sow. Let me summarize this. Here we stand. I can remember coming here with a couple hundred people. Little shopping center. Few things haven't changed in those years. Pastor Brett is a fairly, fairly big man of habit. His are good, some of mine are bad, like he eats a bit less than me. I know you can't tell by looking. <laughs> but over these 27 years, certain things haven't changed. We eat in the same restaurants. We eat the same thing. And we're still covenant brothers. Brett and Cynthia so different. So, so, Kathy and I cannot imagine life without them. They're closer than our own blood. Certain things have changed. Brett did give up cranberry juice, which scared me once in 27 years. <laughs> I could have ordered for him at lunch yesterday. But this church has grown and grown. Thousands have been saved. But this is the moment in time you've been prepared for. Where are you today? Grace Covenant. Need a breakthrough? Need a fresh breath? Need a boatload? We ought to come join me up here, please. You say today, Pastor Jim, I need a breakthrough. Raise your hand. Put him up where I can see him. If you, got, if you need a, say, I need a breath, raise the other hand. Say, just, I need God's breakthrough. He's here. He's breaking through right now. He's breathing on you. He's resuscitating you. Embrace your mission. It'll pull you from the mire. This city the most influential in the world. I'm talking one of the most powerful leaders in his country. His family's so famous. He said to me, you don't realize, Pastor Jim, when the Capitol was mobbed, it scared us so bad. You don't realize the eyes that are on this city around the world. I was talking to one of the most powerful men in part of Europe, one of the greatest financiers in the world. He said to me, what's wrong with you over there? Do you realize despite all your mess, you're still a hole? Jesus puts grace covenant here. This is your city. And in the end, the church, not the White House or the Congress or the Senate or the Supreme Court, and I value our institutions, no. It is the church that will determine the fate of this city and this nation. We are the church, not just Grace Covenant, not just every nation. You say today, Jesus, I want to be used at this moment. Stand to your feet right now. I'm going to pray for you. I want to be used. Holy Ghost, breathe on us. Holy Ghost, bring us your breakthroughs. We aren't here accidentally. Before we were, you knew us. You determined that we would be born at this time and this place. Break through, breathe on us, give us a boatload.